Good morning, members. This is our first meeting in the year of the horse. I wish you health and happiness in the new year. We've all received the papers. I'd like to have your views on our discussion items for the next meeting. Well, let me say this. The proposed items for discussion for the next meeting include upgrading the post of Commissioner for Rehabilitation Post and strengthening the Directorate Manpower of the Rehabilitation Team of the Labour and Welfare Bureau and creation of a one-time limited supernumerary post of AO staff grade C in LWB. That's item 27 and 28 in the list of fast standing items. Just now I discussed with the Deputy Chairman and the Secretariat. We're of the view that just these two items won't take us too long to finish. So I wonder whether you would like to raise any further issues. Now, I'd like to remind you that on the 26th, the budget would be released, quite matching our timetable. Perhaps it's good for us to leave some room for discussing the budget. I believe that those two items will not take up all our time for the next meeting. Perhaps we should leave some time for the budget. Or do you have any new items to propose? If not, uh, we'll leave it uh, there. We'll read the budget first. Of course, the administration will brief us on each and every policy area. I believe labor and welfare will take up quite some portion of the budget. All right, so, so much for our next meeting. Let's proceed to the items for discussion. Well, let's invite the officials to come in. At the same time, I'd like to remind you of ROP 83A. At the meeting, if members have any direct or indirect pecuniary interest in any discussion items, no motion or amendment could be made. So, members, if you have any direct or indirect pecuniary interest in any matter at this meeting, before you speak, you should disclose the nature of those interests. I think you're all very familiar with these regulations. So, officials, please. Good morning. Good morning. We have. Ms. Annie Tan, Permanent Secretary, Ms. Ophelia Wong, Deputy Director of the Planning Department, and other officials. I'd like to remind you that our next regular meeting will be held on the 10th of March. We estimate that the existing two items won't take up the whole meeting. So on the 26th of February, we'll have the budget, so we'll leave some time in the next meeting for the budget. So would you please go back and inform the relevant bureau directors. All right, first item on the agenda, special scheme on privately owned sites for welfare users. Permanent Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. At the meeting on the 23rd of January, the SOW introduced to members the mention of special scheme on privately owned sites for welfare users in the policy address. We'll brief you on this. We'll also propose to transfer $10 billion to the Lotteries Fund, LF, to implement the scheme. And today, we're to report to you the details of the scheme. The purpose of the scheme is that we noted that some welfare services, particularly elderly and rehabilitation services, are in huge demand, but the waiting time has been long. At the same time, welfare organizations owning land sites have reservations on developing their existing sites. So some land sites have not been put to their full use, and some facilities have been in use for a long time and need to be redeveloped. On this issue, in 2012, the 
LWB discussed with the Hong Kong Council of Social Service. With their support, we had two forums on welfare. We absorbed their views. And then in September 2013, we formally invited the welfare organizations to participate in a special scheme. The scheme is to address urgently needed elderly and rehabilitation services and the concerns facing welfare organizations in developing their land sites. So the first issue is for elderly homes and homes for the disabled, there are more urgent needs and the waiting time has been particularly long. So in the discussion, we told the welfare organizations that if they are to participate in this special scheme, we'd like to respect them, provide facilities to them, and among the 11 services, we would like to have some net growth, at least one more place in each service. And then we have certain facilities to assist the welfare organizations to resolve their concerns. There are basically two concerns development procedures and redevelopment procedures. They face planning, lands, and housing conditions, and they think they need some help. Secondly, they're of the view that the existing LF fund arrangements should be more flexible for them. So in enclosure one of the paper, we in Annex 1 of the paper, we've targeted these issues. For example, in Annex 1, we point out that among the 11 services, if they are to effect enhancement, will allow them to have other service facilities so long they satisfy the incumbent requirements and lands and housing conditions. Besides, we consider that it's very invaluable for welfare organizations to redevelop their sites. So not more than 10% of their GFA can be used for ancillary facilities and services by using the LF. Say if they have office needs, if the SWD is of the view that they do have such a need, then in their original facility for elderly services, not more than 10% of extra GFA can be used for office, for expansion, redevelopment, or new developments. All these can be allowed, if possible. Well, some of the premises, well, we hope that these premises of the welfare organizations can be used for at least 25 years under the scheme. And then in E, we offer an exemption to subvented services, because at the moment they have to bid for such services. This is a major concern among NGOs. They don't need to have to compete with other competitors on their own land sites. Now, these NGOs agree that in, in future, through this special scheme, they've got subvention or other special resources. They can give up one bit, that is one tendering exercise. That is when SWD puts forth another tendering exercise, they are willing to give up one chance. For flexible use of the OF, we've proposed a number of measures. In E, we propose a technical feasibility study. If welfare portion constitutes no less than 50% of the NOFA, then we can fully subvent them. Because in the past, if they occupy 49% of non-welfare users, they have to pay for that 49%. And then for decanting, we can also have flexibility, and if possible, the LF can help. As for self-financing services in item G, we now have certain requirements. NGOs must have at least three years of experience and must run the servers for at least five years after obtaining funding from the LF, and they have to raise 10% of the funds. 
In this exercise, after listening to the welfare organizations, we came to the view that for the inexperienced NGOs, the three-year past experience may be too stringent or strict. So we're going to lift that requirement, but they have to satisfy us that they're going to hire sufficiently experienced workers. And then after obtaining the funding, they have to operate the service for at least eight years. And then we can make use of the LF to help them. If suddenly we ask all NGOs to go out and raise 10% of their resources is difficult. And then by way of planning and housing requirements, we've imposed certain requirements on them, and some NGOs told us that they had difficulties. Therefore, under the Office of the CS Administration, we have a coordination office to coordinate the NGOs, that is, the Policy and Project Coordination Unit. On the 18th of September, well, in September, we sent out invitations, and then on the 11th of November, the NGOs came back with responses more enthusiastic than we expected. We now have 46 applications for 60 art sites, 50 art involve new developments or redevelopment projects. Others involve in situ redevelopment or enhanced facilities. If all projects are to follow the plans, 17,000 additional service quotas for the elderly and the disabled will be implemented, including 8,000 rehabilitation quotas and 9,000 elderly places, then the waiting time can be eased. We've uh, looked at the existing situation of the LF. It now has a surplus of about $10 billion. Every year or in the past five years, the average revenue and average expenditure were around $1.6 billion and $800 million per year, respectively. We may need 20 more billion dollars. So the FS has proposed that the government transfers $10 billion to the LF. With members' consent, we'll go to the FC to apply for funding. As to how to implement the scheme, the LWB is discussing with relevant departments, SWD, Lands Department, Planning Department, Buildings Department, and the CS4 Administration's Office in coordinating the task. The SWD, after coordination, will go back to the NGOs on the allocation of services. That is, how much will be subvented, how much to be self-financed, how services can be enhanced, how other services can be provided, etc., etc. We hope uh, that the implementation will be smooth. As for each and every service project, each project is different. Some have already started feasibility studies. Others are still under planning. Therefore, we envisage that such projects will be completed or implemented in different stages. We're very grateful to the Hong Kong Council of Social Service in the past year for its coordination. We're also grateful to the participating NGOs. We thank them for their support, and government departments have also supported us. And with the panel support, we hope we can get this $10 billion. Then with local community support, we'll be able to implement the projects. In a moment, members can give us some ideas and then we hope that we can go to the FC on the 21st of February. Thank you. Members, um, for this topic, we have also invited other electrical members to join us. So there are many members who would like to ask questions. So uh, four minutes each. And I 
hope that we can end the meeting by 12.45 today. Ten members have indicated the intention to speak. Uh, Tang Weichun, Tang Gapiu, uh, Zhang Ju Hong, Kwok uh, Ki, Peng Zheping, Zhang Kwok Chu, Tam Yu Chong, Liang Qi Chang, Liang Yu Chong, Feng Kim Kei, Liang Kwok Hong, Chen Yuan Han. Four minutes each. Let us start now. So first of all, Mr. Xia Weichun. Thank you, Madam Chair. We only have limited land in Hong Kong, so it is very important for us to um, use our land in a best manner. In particular, this is about welfare facilities, so I support this special scheme. But I would like to ask a question about paragraph 6 of the paper. Well, it seems that there are a lot of applications. Uh, there are 60 institute expansion redevelopment or development projects involved. So if uh, um, there are so many applications, has the government set a goal? Because we're talking about 60 projects, and I'm a bit worried. Because now there is already a huge pressure on the construction industry. And we are talking about $20 billion now. And people will feel that uh, the construction industry is very prosperous, and the costs may, as a result, go up. So has the government accord priority to these projects. And for redevelopment or expansion, well, um, the existing facilities will be affected to a certain extent. So there may be more disadvantages than advantages. So I would like to ask about these. And also, I mentioned the pressure on the construction industry. And how about the civil servants? I think um, it would also mean a lot of workload for the civil servants. And I have heard a lot of complaints from the relevant trade unions. I hope that they won't burst at the seams. If this means a huge pressure on the civil service, then I think this will mean a big problem. So I hope the permanent secretary can answer these questions first. Thank you, Ms. Tam. I would like to thank the um, member for his concern. Well, for this project, when we talked to the welfare sector last year, we told them that we need certain facilities um, urgently and particularly, so we hope that they will provide these facilities first. And we told them that within two months' time, uh, we hope that they could uh, put forward their proposals. Otherwise, we would adopt a first-come, first-serve um, approach. Now, we are talking about 17,000 places, but we need um, all these services. So that's why we are not going to screen the projects. As pointed out in the paper, Different organizations have different timetables uh, because they are at different stages. Some of the projects have already started to um, do the feasibility study, and some other organizations are just putting forward proposals. And they still have to talk to the SWD, and um, they have to rationalize their subvented and self financing parts. And also, they have to comply with the um, planning, housing, land requirements, etc. So, as indicated in the paper, um, these organizations have different timetables. In the coming five to ten years, these projects will start one by one. So, there will not be an immediate pressure. Um, on the construction industry and the civil service. But um, we would like to seek the funds because we want to um, be more stable. I hope that when they um, try to seek the funding, they should at least uh, tell us what the timetable is in the coming 10 years because we're talking about $10 billion. Now, for the $10 billion, it will be put in the LF. It doesn't mean that um, it has to be spent within a certain number of years. Um, we just want people to have confidence that is, there are enough resources. As for the SWD, well, certain um, there will be certain manpower deployments, 
and for the other departments, um, they will be able to absorb the work with the existing manpower. Now, for these four projects, uh, each well, they are all very important. Now, because um, we have been discussing that we do not have enough places. Well, this is a win-win situation for society, for the um, organizations, and for the government. Now, for providing day centers or, or residential centers, well, um, it will take a long time to uh, provide them, at least 10 years. Now you're talking about 17,000 places. Can we have them in five years or in 10 years? This is question number one. As for question number two, I see that there are some expansion and redevelopment projects. So for this 40 social welfare organizations, I think uh, some of them are already providing um, institution services. So if, well, how many places are they providing at the time? Because if they are going to carry out expansion or redevelopment works, then what will happen to the existing service users? Otherwise, will we suddenly have 1,000 service users that are deprived of their existing services? So for these 40 uh, social welfare organizations, uh, how many places are they providing at the moment? Um, thirdly, it's about commitment. Well, the organizations are providing their sites and you are providing the money. Now, for the construction of facilities, it's a one-off commitment. But how about ongoing commitments, in particular for residential care for the elderly? Are you going to subvent all the places in the future? As I said just now, we're talking about 60 projects, and they are at different stages at the moment. And initially, when we look at them, by 2017 to 18, at least five projects will be completed. As for the other projects, um, they would have to be completed in stages after 2017 and 18. As for redevelopment and expansion, there are 50 of them. As for the remaining uh, projects, they are new developments. As for redevelopment projects, as I said in the paper, we have to liaise with the welfare organizations about um, existing places. Uh, there may be decanting arrangements, and we will try our best to help them with the LF. When we look at the um, details of the projects, actually uh, one organization would be responsible for several projects. So the organization uh, would take care of the uh, Arrangements. Well, if they have several arrangements, or for example, if they have two arrangements or two projects, they will do one project first, and uh, after the first project is completed, the second project will start. So, uh, by doing so, they can have a more proper decanting arrangement. And if the redevelopments can be divided into stages, they will do so. So you mean that when they make the application, they have to take care of their existing service users, right? So um, they will not trans, they will not um, shift the problem onto the SWD, right? Correct. Well, can you ask your question in second round, please? Because for your third question, um, there will be a very long answer. Next, um, Dr. Fernando Chang. Well, of course, we support this kind of development. Because for elderly and rehabilitation facilities, we do have a serious shortage. Now, although in the paper I find a table, it is not too clear. Because uh, under the big categories, there are different subcategories. For example, uh, services for the elderly, there can, uh, for the um, People with disabilities, there can be day activity center, sheltered workshop, etc. So I need to know the details. 
please give us more information and we are talking about 17,000 more places so how can it help um, to reduce the waiting time for uh, which type of services we, we need to know all these and we know um, we want to know how many projects are about expansion addition redevelopment development and we need to know the timetables the capacities I need to know all these details It seems that the NGOs are receiving your proposal well, and in the past they were quite worried about um, the arrangements. For example, the differences between a Buddhist organization and a Taoist organization. So uh, this time around, um, the arrangement is much better. However, for the financing, for a self-financing facility area. Is there a requirement now after redevelopment would only uh, would there be a difference like um, only fifty percent of the facility would be uh, used for subvented places I hope that the new facilities would mainly uh, be uh, for subvented purposes. Now we have received proposals from these organizations and now we are um, negotiating with them. As for the detailed information requested by uh, Dr. Fernando Chang, well, I'm not giving you the information because now we are still um, discussing with them and they, some of them have only put together a feasibility study. They have not gone through the town planning process yet. So these are just their proposals and this may not be their final plans. So if you we give you the details after the discussions the details may change. But we will try our best uh, to provide you uh, with the relevant information and in Annex 1 you can see that um, there are uh, different types of uh, welfare services. As for uh, item 4, 5 and 6, uh, we have 2,751 2, places. As for item 10 and 11, preschool service, we have uh, 3,842 places. As Mr. Tang asked a uh, question just now, that is about the uh, proportion of uh, supplanted and self financing services. Well, we will talk to the organizations individually. As for ancillary facilities such as offices, we hope that they won't take up too much space because um, we need to provide these 11 services. So uh, for offices, um, if it's up to of uh, 24 meters, well, uh, that is okay, but they will still have to um, comply with the town planning requirements. Well, I'm talking about the proportion um, of areas uh, between subvented and self financing services. Well, we have to talk to the organizations individually because some organizations would like to um, have more subvented places and others would like to have more self financing places. So we will respect their uh, views. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Kokaki. Madam Chair, well, it sounds like a good news, but there are several problems. For example, for residential uh, services for the um, 
people with disabilities, you only have uh, 2,000 odd places. But I think that is a service um, in huge demand, but you do not pay too much attention to that. Is that uh, a responsible manner? You have to see whether or not they're rushing for the same services by just winning a bit first. Dr. Fernando Chung already mentioned the self-financing services. For those citizens who cannot afford the costs, that would be a heavy burden. If you disregard them altogether, then you'll be opening up a floodgate. Some organizations will get your money first because you have $20 billion there. As for the self-financing projects, they are not regulated. I did hear that the senior management of some organizations have been paying very high salaries to their own staff. That's a big problem in the welfare sector. So why doesn't the administration map out a direction for them? And then for the service period, in just eight years' time, the government is to give them so much money. Why don't you ask them to give a permanent undertaking? We've given them all the money to construct the facilities, to carry out feasibility studies, etc., etc. In eight years' time, if the organization is to transform to another type of organization, say by running youth hostels or even hotels, as in certain cases that we've seen, will this be a big loophole? by allowing welfare organizations to transform to something else as they like in future. Permanent Secretary, these 11 projects are actually what we re request from the welfare organizations. We do need these services. Well, but the urgency is different. Well, roughly speaking, for these services, we do need some government sites to complement the inadequacy. Now, these projects will lay a foundation for us for further studies so that we'll know what future planning should be. We won't ask all NGOs to provide these 17,000 places and then the government needs to do nothing. We'll try to make full use of their land sites. They're on their own land sites. We'd like them would like to assist them in their redevelopment so as to enhance their services. That does not mean that in future we will we'll no longer identify further land sites for other homes and centers. As I said, we will also provide our own land sites in future. In this exercise, we'll make sure that they satisfy the planning requirements. We'll also see whether the leases have to be modified. The lease conditions have to be observed. They cannot use the land site, say, for hotels. If they want to do so, they have to come back to the government to apply for a modification. For a self-financing project, will set requirements. And for lease modifications, they must obtain consent from the social welfare department first. What about the service period? For social welfare services, they will be the same as those projects obtaining funding under the LF. For subvented services, they have to observe the subvention conditions. All right, point taken. We have a long queue. 2468, eight members for the first round, and one more member for the second round. The original schedule is that uh, this item should finish at 11.45. So I'll draw a line there. Four minutes per member. If you ask fewer questions, we can grasp our time better. I'm worried that if we are behind schedule, we may impact on the next item, which is also our concern. Next, Mr. Pun Ping. Thank you, Madam Chairman. According to the paper, the government is to go to the FC for $10 billion. I discover that in recent times, large 
funding applications to the FC are for the use of the organizations themselves. Now, the proposed sum now is $10 billion for this special scheme. Well, what about monitoring by the government? Although in paragraph 11, you mentioned something about monitoring. So this is a special scheme. Will there be special monitoring? The initial sum applied for is $10 billion. And what about the remaining $10 billion? Further application to the FC or it should come to the LF. As for the 17,390 places, I'd like to know the manpower required and any supporting measures. Now, for these projects, they may be completed at different stages soonest in 2017-18. So how many places in that year? Say how many places in 2017, how many in 2018, etc. Permanent Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. With the support of the FC, this $10 billion won't be for dedicated projects. It will be ploughed into the LF and all projects can apply for funding to the LF. So it will be $10 billion plus the surplus in the LF, not just for this special scheme. For this $10 billion, we have to let the parties concerned that they will not be affected by this special scheme. Well, at the moment, the LF has a balance of about $10 billion. Given our past experience, in the past five years, uh, there's an average revenue of about $1.6 billion and an average expenditure of $800 million per year. So for the time being, the operation of the LF will not be affected if we give them $10 billion more or $10 billion more. As for manpower, usually we'll ask the applying organization to plan for their manpower. It should know that the new facilities will be completed in, say, five, five years' time, seven years' time, or whatnot. So they have to plan for their manpower. And the government will see whether we have to help them, say, by providing training. Because in their recruitment exercises, they do need talents and professionals. In 2017-18, some projects, given their progress, can be completed. As for the other projects, we'll have to look at the lands and planning procedures. Next, Deputy Chairman, Mr. Chang Kwok Chi. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I believe for the 17,000 odd places in 60 odd projects, we we'll have to rely on the hard work of the HKCSS. And of course, the experience of the Permanent Secretary is also very important. I'd like to raise one point. This is a big operation. Operation. Yes, in five to ten years' time, you're going to provide an additional 10 or thousand places. In the next few years, we may have a few thousand more places. This is unprecedented. Therefore, I believe that we should have a comprehensive plan covering the service demands, where they are, how much or how many quotas of different services can be provided, etc. You cannot just rely on the NGOs themselves and let them say what they want to do, as they can change their land use the government should have some expectation on them. For elderly residential services, 6,000 to 7,000 places. For the PWDs, 2,000 odd. I'm concerned about the daycare services for both categories. In certain cases, the figure is zero or just dozens of places. 
for daycare services, they should be provided near the homes of the recipients. Other services can be cross-district in nature. So you should have a comprehensive plan. Which NGOs provide what daycare services in which districts? And for the government, what support will be offered? Central and Western Zero in two aspects. One ties in PWD Zero, Islands PWD Zero, Elderly Daycare Services, 20 only, Shatin, both zeros, Typo, Elderly Daycare Services, zero. Now, the government will have to fill the gaps. So please tell us in future at different stages we'd like to have input from the government. We should not make certain districts very abundant in provision while other districts are to be starved to death. So please also tell us the self-financed quotas. And manpower match must also be considered by you. You have to know what services will be used, and the manpower support is very important. Finally, for the LF, you're only calculating that the average revenue is about $1.6 billion per year. That's dangerous. Renovation, repair, and so forth have to be subvented. So you need to make preparation for those needs. Uh, one or ten billion dollars won't be enough. Permanent Secretary, we fully understand the views of uh, the Deputy Chairman. We need to, to integrate the services. Under the Elderly Commission, there will be a scheme for the elderly. First of all, we'll ask the Elderly Commission to look at this special scheme to see what support is going to lend to this scheme. And then how the government is to top up all these provisions, we'll look into them. Yes, time's up. Uh, please follow up uh, on the issue on other occasions. Mr. Tam Yu Chung, Madam Chairman, the special scheme is good. We always say that we lack premises for increasing elderly services. Now we're making use of the existing homes and centers. If they want to further develop themselves, we're going to help them. I did visit some district facilities. For example, in Tun Moon, in a certain home, they still have space for further development. S the same occurs on Chang Chao. But pro probably those land sites are not for buildings. The administration may not allow them to build structures on their land sites. So land leases may have to be modified. Without the assistance of the LWB and this special scheme, it's impossible for them to do so. So now we have this policy to make use of these invaluable land resources to increase the number of beds. The workload involved will be heavy, be it the LWB or relevant apartments or, or NGOs the workload will be heavy. Still, I believe it's worthwhile to do it so that we can make full use and good use of our resources. As for the figures in Annex 2, the information is not very clear. You have 18 districts and give us figures for each district. In each district, how many institutions and projects do we have? Annex 2 is not clear. For example, a developer says that he is providing a great deal of land in Yuen Long for Pokoi Hospital. Is that also covered under the scheme? Or are you going to tell us that this $10 billion won't be able to resolve the matter? According to newspaper reports, they're going to build the biggest home in Hong Kong, providing 2,000 residential places. As for this project between the hospital and the land developer, is it covered under the scheme or is it under another scheme? 
Permanent Secretary. Well, Annex 2 um, is the initial information uh, provided to us at the moment. The SWD still have to talk to the NGOs, so we will have to work out the details. And we will also have to look at the feasibility reports as well as the development plans, whether they are in line with uh, planning and land requirements, etc. So um, there will be details later. So members asked us for a table concerning different districts. So this is a table. And Mr. Tam is very um, concerned about the um, Chin Moon site, which uh, was donated by a developer. The developer and Port Oil Hospital issued a press release last November. They say that Um, Henderson Land uh, will be donating a site to Port Royal Hospital, and the site is at Lamte. And um, before the 18th of November, that's our deadline, Port Royal Hospital um, also submitted its plan to us. So this plan is already covered by this special scheme. So for the two places, 2130, that's, um, that's plan, right? So um, that would take up the biggest proportion. Mr. Lang Chicha. Well, this is a new scheme, and I think it will be successful. Now, in paragraph 6, it is stated that the um, NGOs are very happy about this. So this new initiative uh, will be welcomed by NGOs. I hope that well now the government invited applications in September last year. In the future, can you also come up with similar schemes? I have a similar questions as Mr. Tam Yu Chong because I think um, the information you give to us is not too detailed. You are saying that there are 40 social welfare organizations which involve uh, more than 60 institute expansion rate developments or development projects. Now if it's just redevelopment and the number of places will not increase. The same goes for expansion. Well for Expansion, um, there will be an increase in places, but I do not see the details. You say that the total number is oh, 17,000, but um, you, some of these organizations are already providing places, so do you have to uh, deduct that number? I'm not too clear about these figures. Well, it seems that well for 17,000 places is a huge number, but maybe half of them are existing places. So um, that will not be such a big addition. Anyway, this is an improvement. So I have another question. Well, for these kind of services, um, we do not just look at um, the hardware. If you have more than 10,000 additional places, but there are not enough additional manpower, then uh, we would, would not work. I'm very worried about the manpower issue. Now, um, each year you are saying that you are training 1,000 young people for this type of uh, service. So how about in the future, will you be increasing the training places? Uh, for young people so that they can join um, the elderly service industry. And it is where well, we are not allowed to import um, foreign labors. So what can be done about manpower? Permanent Secretary. Well, f for the um, information provided to m members, um, it seems that uh, they are not too comprehensive because we are now still discussing with the NGOs. So um, we are just providing members with the uh, breakdown figures according to districts. So.
So for this seventeen thousand places, they are additional. So you have already taken out the existing places. Yes, this is a net increase. We hope that we can enhance the service by doing so. Yes, we are also very concerned about manpower, and we hope that when the NGOs look at the uh, new uh, projects, um, they can tell us that they would have the relevant manpower. So these NGOs can also provide trainings. Well, in the policy address, um, it is already stated that we will encourage young people to join um, this this kind of service industry. So we will we'll, uh, work in this area. Now there is a huge shortage in uh, service for the elderly and uh, the rehabilitation. So um, I think this scheme is a good one. But I hope that you won't just rely on this scheme and slow down your pace of providing your own services. So I want to know how this special scheme would affect the government's provision of service places. Now, when I look at the table, you uh, next to the paper, I see that there is no place increase. Um, in central and western, and at, and at the islands uh, for the places for PWDs, um, there is also zero increase. <coughs> so, will the government do something in these areas? At least you should strike a balance. That is. For each district, there would be an increase in places, and the service users do not have to go to another district to receive service. And Jiang Guoqi's questions are our concerns as well. Now there is an increase in service places, but how about the uh, um? Can you tell us whether these places are provided solely by the private sector, or some of them are provided by the public sector? Because you are subventing these places. And also, I would like to ask a third question. You say that for redevelopment, you can help. Oh. How can you help in the decanting arrangement? You said that you will try your best to help. So what does that mean? Now there are three questions. First, well, how um, does the government cooperate with the NGOs? Well, the special scheme has its own targets and we will we'll continue um, to monitor the situation. For the elderly, um, the elderly commission is going to um, put together a, a new scheme for the elderly. As for PWDs, we will also ask the uh, Rehabilitation Society to take a look at the situation. And see how the government can help. I'm very worried about this. They are just saying that they will look at it. So you will look at these figures, and they will look at the situation, and you do not have a development plan on your own. We have our own development plan. If time allows, I can ask uh, Mr. Lamb to tell you about our own development plan. It will not be affected. As for subvented and self-financing uh, places and the distributions, uh, we would look at the service demands. Now we are giving uh, figures to members at the moment, but these are not the final figures. We have to talk to the NGOs and the SWD. We have to talk to these NGOs um, separately. But you are already subventing the redevelopment. So you still have to talk to them. 
Now, can you not give them a guideline? Yes, we will give them a guideline. Well, next time, uh, show us the guideline. Mr. Uh, Fetcher Fong, I have two types of questions. First, well, I think this is a good scheme. But when it comes to expansion and the increase in surface, you also need more manpower. The permanent secretary said um, the relevant NGOs should um, take care of the manpower arrangement. Uh, but um, can they do it fast enough? Because, well, if you need manpower, you need um, tertiary institutions to train up the relevant people. And many institutions are complaining that they cannot hire people. So this is very important. If you do not do the planning now, after three to five years when these projects are completed, how can you have enough manpower to do the work? The government has to plan. Now, if they say that they need 4,000 or 5,000, oh, sorry, 400 or 500 people, they don't know where to find these people. And also, after the expansions, um, there will be more traffic. There will be more people flow. So, have you look at the environmental impact, the traffic impact um, in the surrounding areas? Do they have to submit to you such uh, impact reports? As for manpower arrangements, I have said many times that we are very concerned about. This. Now, if we have asked the NGOs um, to provide training, and also um, they have to come up with their manpower plan, and also the elderly commission as well as the rehabilitation uh, commission will also be looking at this. Now, if we want um, university to the university is to help us uh, do the training. We will talk to the universities and the education bureau. Well, because with this kind of developments, they also have to comply with the um, housing uh, planning land rules. So um, they would have to go through the town planning procedures. And uh, maybe Mr. Wong can answer these questions as well. Uh, Miss Wong. Now, for the NGOs, they will submit their plans to us, and our uh, department will look at the submissions very carefully. The uh, submissions or their plans will also be circulated to other government departments. Um, they will look at different aspects, for example, um, traffic. Um, Environmental impacts, uh, the acceptance uh, by the communities, etc. Or, for example, if they are trying to build a 20-story building in a um, low-density area, then we will um, talk to them and ask them to uh, reduce the density. As for traffic impacts, we also uh, will. Uh, look at that because um, they have to work in accordance with the town planning ordinance, and their development should not have any negative impact um, on the uh, nearby uh, areas. And if there is a need to make changes, we will um, consult. Um, community consultations and will will make changes to the online zoning plans accordingly. Mr. Lang Kuo Hong, well, I had a very bad experience about this because um, Yan'an Hospital in my constituency cheated the government. Um, for a lot, and then they built luxury buildings on it. Well, now it seems that um, you have decided on this scheme is okay, but I would like to know more about the uh, proportion of self financing facilities. Now, the town planning board may have to make 
adjustments so as to accommodate this uh, applications and the lottery fund would have to fund it. So if the number of fin self financing uh, places is more or less the same as subvented places, I don't think that's a huge improvement. Uh, after um, you imp implemented the lump sum grants, uh, uh, arrangements, uh, things have changed. Now the LF have, or the LF will provide funding to the NGO, and afterwards, the NGO would have the sole power to run the facilities, and you are not going to monitor that NGO. I am very worried about um, the so-called sovereignty. So in five or ten years' time, if they change the purpose of these facilities, how are you going to monitor them? And what if they change the proportion, or are you going to sign a long-term contract with them? Um, Permanent Secretary, as I said just now, for self-financing services and subvented services, we need to look at the service demands. We'll give them guidelines and reach consensus with them before we allow them to use the money under LF. We're monitoring this. If they want to change, they must have the consent of the government. With the consent of the chairman, perhaps I should defer to Mr. Lam, the deputy director. The, there is this existing arrangement. Mr. Lam, gradually, with the NGOs who have submitted preliminary plans, we're discussing service matches in their proposals. For example, if they say they want to provide services to the mentally disabled or provide rehabilitation services or elderly services, we'll discuss the details with them. If they're talking about daycare services, we'll look at the district demand. Well, I don't regard or I don't consider what they'll be doing. If they want to go to the town planning board to change the leases, if they want to use the LF, well, to use the LF is good. But in what way can you ensure that they observe your conditions? Mr. Yik said that you should at least require them to give a pledge of five years. Well, in the land lease, it is specified which type of social service they'll be providing. In future, after the duration of service, if they want to do anything, if they want to change, they must have the permission of the SWD. Some NGOs have been using LF funds to provide self-financing services, and all along they've been operating such services, sometimes even exceeding the expectation of the LF. So five years is guaranteed, but the sixth year is not guaranteed. This is crucial. Simple answer, please. Deputy Director, as I said, in the lease is specified what services they have to provide. If there's to be any change, they must have the consent of the SWD. In our actual experience, self-financing services on the lots have actually exceeded the duration required under the LF. Well, I think it's about time for us to wrap up. We're five minutes behind schedule. Mr. Frankie Ye came in rather late. We've drawn a line already, sorry. All right. You ask your question then. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Two issues here. First of all, I welcome this special scheme. I hope that private lots can be put to their full uses. I agree that uh, all modifications must have the permission of the Town Planning Board. Mr. Long Kwok Hong raised a very interesting issue. Well, the paper says that uh, the services have to run for at least five years. Well, services should change with time. Now is 11 projects. In future, there may be additions and subtractions. It's not appropriate for you to 
impose rigid requirements on them. But in the agreement, you have to specify that any changes in land use in future must have the consent of the SWD. Say if they promise two stories, if that is to change, they must have the consent of the SWD, which will consider the prevailing social demands. I wonder whether I have answered Mr. Long Kwok Hong's question. Permanent Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. As we explained, if welfare organizations want to join this special scheme, if self-financing projects are involved, they have to observe our service requirements, say for eight or ten years. Any changes must be approved by the Director of Social Welfare. Otherwise, the leases won't meet our requirements. Well, Madam Chairman, just now Mr. Frederick Fong was very worried about manpower not being able to meet uh, the requirements of the services. We're very concerned about the frontliners. So I think we can temporarily and suitably import labor. Permanent Secretary, Madam Chairman, as I said, the government is concerned about manpower match. We've invited two legal panels to advise us on long-term planning. As far as possible, we'll emphasize local training. There is a scheme to assist young persons, to encourage them to join the healthcare sector or caring sector. So the government will see how it can help. It's, it's my turn. My remarks are simple. I'll like to follow up on the Permanent Secretary's remarks, Mr. Frankie Yick's remarks, and colleagues' concern this morning. I did tell the Permanent Secretary that in society, we have over 400,000 women ready to take up jobs. They're dispersed in various communities. For such development projects, you should encourage NGOs to absorb such women as carers. They can be carers in their own homes. In North Europe and ancient China, that was the case. So, Permanent Secretary, have you ever considered this under the scheme? You should consider it this. Secondly, in 50-odd premises covering 40-odd organizations, my feeling is that these organizations will have to face their own difficulties in development or redevelopment. For the existing users, the elders, the PWDs, how are you going to do coordination? If you leave everything to the NGOs, it's very disturbing. So will you have a coordinating framework? Say for Queen Mary Hospital redevelopment, they also have a dedicated task force. You are now referring all these to the NGOs themselves. So, Permanent Secretary, how are you going to go about this? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Previously, you also gave us some invaluable advice on the women, on these 60-odd landlords, maybe child care services, self-financing child care services can be provided with women carers. We have interdepartmental discussion on this. We can encourage welfare organizations to do so. But services and the existing quotas must not be affected. Say for elderly services and PWD services, we should as far as possible not to affect them. For child care services, usually there is a height restriction. Other elderly services and PW services also have a height restriction, so there must be coordination. Perhaps uh, Ms. Wong can also assist us. Maybe we can have horizontal development. We'll try as far as possible to help. We believe some welfare organizations will be interested in this. We hope we can assist in women employment. As for coordination, we now have an interdepartmental group and then we've revived our discussion with the HKCSS. The HKCSS has been very good. 
It has been coordinating other welfare organizations for us, and two forums have been organized. So there will be a coordinating mechanism. Permanent Secretary, I'd like to commend you on this special scheme. You're handling social demands for elderly services and PWD services, which are in acute shortage. And now you have the SWD to help you. That's an improvement. Yes, yeah, society lacks services for the elders and the PWDs and relevant staff. If you have a theme, you should tell us. And then Deputy Director, you should also consider this. We must have an all-win scenario for all parties concerned. As Mr. Tankapio said, you should pass your suggestions to Mrs. Carrie Lam, the coordinator. So we must adopt a two-pronged approach. We're concerned about manpower shortage, which may become a big problem. Finally, Dr. Fernando Zhang. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Two minutes. Well, the government told us uh, that in this month, they'll go to the FC. Quite a huge sum is involved, $10 billion. Overall expenditure will exceed $20 billion. The information we got now is not comprehensive. The Permanent Secretary said that certain issues have not been ironed out, like town planning, lands department, lease modifications, etc. Honestly speaking, CY Leung said a lot, but those have not been endorsed. 36 GIC sites, have they been endorsed? No, but he has already said them. And for these organizations, you already have their locations, but you don't let us have the information. But you want us to approve your funding application. We are a monitor, we are a gatekeeper. Without information, how can we do gatekeeping? Just now, I already expressed my concern. I'm worried that for offended services and other, that is, residual services, if we don't have a ceiling, we may be using public money to assist NGOs to build a building, but maybe in that building only 20 to 30 percent are offended services. Others are self-financing services. So the government may be using public resources to effect developments that are not conducive to public interest and are not urgent services. We may eventually be providing self-financing services like businesses. So you have to give us all the information. Overall speaking, this is a good thing. We're very clear about this. All those speaking members are in support of the scheme, but you have to give us the information. Don't hide information from us, and don't just get the scheme passed. Permanent Secretary? Well, in fact, we've already provided you with information. I believe that for the $10 billion applied for, we won't give the $10 billion to the NGOs in one go. We'll plow the $10 billion into the LF, and all projects have to be approved by the SWD. And funding will be allocated in phase, not as one-off grants. If any LF project exceeds $10 million in recurrent expenditure, every time will come to the FC for funding. So there's no question of the NGOs using the money as they wish. The money will be put in the LF. You don't need to worry. So one project will not affect other projects. And you don't need to worry about lack of resources. Some organizations are worried about lack of resources. They have to follow the LF procedures, which have always been stringent. My feeling is that the organizations want more flexibility, not that we're not prudent enough. Well, Permanent Secretary, Fernando Zhang said that you need to give us all these specifics for the organizations, including their locations, their future, and so forth. He also mentioned subvented services and self-financed services. The government seems to be changing the proportion of subvented services 
for PW services and elderly services, we're concerned that in future, members of the public will have to rely heavily on the private sector. You have to think of government commitment. So to be fair, Permanent Secretary, you have to give us more figures before we can support you. And what more you are thinking of, you have to tell us, right? Yes. We now make it clear that for the 60-odd locations, they should give us uh, an expected completion timetable, be it redevelopment or expansion. They have to make everything clear, what services are to be provided, floor area, uses, how much for offers, how much for subvented services, how much for non subvented services, etc., etc. I think they should list all these out. I believe they already have the information. Before they go to the FC, they have to give us a comprehensive paper. The Deputy Chairman and I mentioned long-term planning under the scheme. They should not adopt a fragmented approach. Well, your opinion is clear. Colleagues, the situation now is, well, I'll see whether you agree or not. In February, they'll go to the FC, and of course, Normally, the practice is that at the panel level, ancillary conditions can be proposed. I want more transparency from the government. I'd like to emphasize that last year, when the government talked to me and the deputy chairman, it's after the summer vacation, where the few officials involved worked very expeditiously. We know that services have to be expanded. Many NGOs want to participate. They immediately did something. So our feeling is that the SWD and the Welfare Bureau and the Planning Department must collaborate in this exercise. Yes, we know this will add to your workload, but if we are to give you $10 billion, $10 billion we have to look into the details. So Permanent Secretary, give us as many particulars as possible. Members, um, do you agree that this scheme be submitted to the FC in February, so there's no objection. Of course, we agree. However, if by the FC meeting we still do not get this information, then I cannot rule out the possibility of voting it down. We agree on the direction, and we trust that we wants the government to carry it forward. However, if by that meeting um, they still do not give us the relevant information, then I really have reservations. I think she has not answered my questions just now. If she cannot give me clear answers, then how can we approve the funding? Well, a month's difference is not that big. I think most members agree that this um, application be submitted to the FC in February. So I hope that by then the government would give us uh, more details. I hope things can run smoothly because this is a good scheme. So let us take it that is endorsed by us today. I believe members are not objecting to it, right? Okay, thank you. I would also like to thank the government officials. Next item. Pilot scheme on living allowance for carers of elderly persons from low income families. Members, well, many of you would like to ask questions. And I hope that you can ask as short a question as possible so that um, the government officials can be given more time to answer. Permanent Secretary, are you going to take us through this paper? Yes, I will be as brief as possible. Well, the CE in his policy address has already said this. That is, he will be asking the community care fund to, uh, or the community care fund task force, to put together a pilot scheme on living allowance for carers of elderly persons. And Dr. Lo Chi Kong, um, the chairman of the community care fund, has also uh, has been talking to um, the stakeholders. We have uh, had uh, views 
and we have also looked at the comments made by members um, previously um, at this panel. So in March, we will be uh, submitting a uh, proposal to the uh, Community Care Fund, and this proposal is set out in the paper. We um, have outlined the eligibility criteria, the minimum hours of caregiving, the capability of picking up the care role, the timetable, etc. So I would like to um, give more time to members so that they can ask questions. So I'm not going into the great details. And your views will also be incorporated into a paper to be submitted to the CCFTF. Well, many members have raised their hands. Four minutes each. Um, if we do not have enough time, I will uh, give you less time later. First, uh, Gary Fang. I welcome this pilot scheme on allowance on living allowance for carers of um, elderly persons. I support the direction. However, I'm concerned about the um, district elderly community centers, neighborhood elderly centers, home care service teams and daycare centers, etc., which are, are providing the service now, and they are going to provide trainings to the carers. So for this funding, will there be uh, resources earmarked? For this type of training, because now I think they already have a very heavy workload. If you increase the workload by adding um, assessments and training, I'm worried that you cannot achieve the um, last target of your scheme that is um, to implement things effectively. Well, as set out in paragraph 9 of the paper, we hope that through DECCs and NECs, um, certain work can be done. For example, to assess the carers, whether they are capable of doing the job, and to identify uh, training programs for the carers, and many of these um, programs are free and actually um, uh, home. They uh, will also be responsible for home visits and um, liaise closely with responsible workers. So for DECCs and NECs, the CCF will be uh, providing certain subsidies. We understand that um, this scheme will increase the workload, so we will be um, giving them service fees. As for trainings, on page 3 of the paper, it is stated that when the carers um, go to trainings and if the um, training agencies are going to charge them, then the fees can be uh, refunded if they make an application to the SWD. Can you give us the relevant information after the uh, meeting? Now, we are now liaising with the um, DECCs and NECs, and if they are providing this kind of services to us, uh, what level of service fees would they need? Next, Mr. Chen Chichun. I think we all agree on the grand direction, that is to provide cash uh, living allowance for the carers. Well, I think this is of too small a scale because uh, we are only talking about $120 million. Now for these carers, um, will we be uh, worried that um, they would cheat the government because it is very difficult to monitor them because most of these uh, carers, they are family members or they are relatives, and they may um, blow up the uh, figure of uh, work hours. 
and you cannot monitor them all the time. Well, even if you don't give them the uh, allowance, they would continue to do the work. And you are saying that um, for this new kind of service. Um, it should not weaken the sense of family obligation, nor diminish the virtue of filial piety. So, there will not be anybody resigning from their present jobs in order to um, get your allowance. Because for your allowance, if you divide it by hours, it's just like twenty odd dollars per hour. So it's just um, minimal assistance to them. So if that person um, is taking a part-time job. I don't think he or she would resign from the job in order to be a carer. So this is just an allowance, just to help them out a bit. So I think you should be more lenient because this is because this is an encouragement. Well, some people may abuse um, the government's policy. And even for traffic allowances, people may do that. Now, because this is under the CCF, so there will be a means test. But if this is an encouragement measure, maybe um, you should do better. Maybe the carer will just be using the money to uh, provide better food for the elderly. So can you be more lenient? Uh, these carers would have to stay at home to take care of the elderly instead of going to work at 7-Eleven. So now you're providing them with a living allowance. So a carer will take care of an elder, and each month um, he or she will receive $2,000. At most, he can get $4,000. Does it mean that if he or she takes care of Two persons of more than maximum, he can get a maximum amount of four thousand dollars per month. Oh, well, there are several questions. Well, in the paper, we have um, talked about the minimum hours of caregiving. You can see that we are more flexible than other uh, overseas uh, places. For example, in some uh, places, the carer cannot be the spouse, and for some other uh, places, the there are other restrictions. As for the uh, minimum hours of care uh, giving, well, in Australia, they um, stipulated it to be 24 hours. And in the UK, the elder has to sign and confirm the hours of care giving. So we are adopting a more flexible arrangement already. The carer can make a record and give the record to the SWD. And if the SWD has queries, um, he can um, ask the elder. Uh, we have uh, considered all these uh, factors, and we think that we can adopt a more lenient approach in Hong Kong. And many of the carers are spouses, so we do not want to impose this restriction. As for means test, uh, we have uh, limited resources, and we have looked at overseas experiences. We think that um, with the means test, the resources can be used more effectively. For example, in UK, Canada, and in certain um, states of the US and in France, they also um, have a means test. Mr. Chen is right. Now, if um, the carer takes care of one elder, and if um, the minimum hours are reached, then $2,000 would be given. If he takes care of two elders, now uh, because we discovered that some uh, carers takes care of more than one um, elders in Hong Kong, and if um, he uses more than 120 hours, then we would give a maximum of four thousand dollars. Mr. Chan Kapil, of course, this is a very good attempt. Uh, we have heard from the PWDs and the carers. Uh, it seems that the government is not providing them with enough support. And now you are starting with the carer for the elderly. I think this is also a good start. But I have several questions. Now, if the carer does not live with the elder, and um, he just lives next door, and he uh, takes care of the elder for 80 hours, 
per month than uh, what and uh, will be done. And now there is no age limit. I think that is good. And a spouse can take care of his spouse, and uh, he can be he or she can be regarded as a carer. That is good. However, you are saying that the carer cannot be on um, old age living allowance. Now, for CSSA, of course, is different. But however, however, for a carer who's on old age living allowance, how come he cannot enjoy this living allowance? I find it very strange. For sick young. Therefore. 18,000 recipients was suddenly decreased to 2,000. You said that uh, you envisage that 18,000 people will benefit from this scheme. But the quota is 2,000, a hefty drop of 90%. And this old age living allowance may be saved, and so you'll be able to save a great deal of money. Permanent Secretary, as the paper says, we've made reference to other jurisdictions. In October, the Hong Kong U conducted a survey last year on the living allowance for the elderly. So we don't require the carer to live with the elder concerned. We are not prepared to propose this to the CCF task force. And then in the central waiting list, those waiting for long-term care, there are 18,000 elders living in the community. But actually, we don't have the information of the carers concerned, for example, their income. So we don't know how, how many are eligible. In any case, as a pilot scheme, as a starting point, we'd like to try out these 2,000 first. As for the living allowance to carers of elderly persons, we're talking about the low-income families. If the carer is rather aged and receiving a living allowance, the Living Alliance is also targeted at assisting the elders in providing a living allowance. So the two are duplicated in our view. So we cannot allow this duplication. In that case, for the transport subsidy for low-income families, you can also abolish it. You can say that they're already receiving certain subsidies so they cannot give this living allowance. Well, sometimes a 60-year-old daughter may be taking care of an 85-year-old mother, and males too, maybe. You call this pilot scheme. I don't understand. Permanent Secretary, thank you, Madam Chairman. Just now I explained that the objectives of both schemes are that if the carer is already receiving an old age living allowance. This living allowance is also subsidizing the carer, so we don't want duplicated subsidies. As for the transport subsidy, the paper also says that uh, we'll carefully handle that. All right, we'll continue. Mr. Yang Yuchong, Madam Chairman. The government emphasizes that this is a pilot scheme, and they're going to select 2,000 for trial. I don't know whether they're setting the 2,000 as a standard. If it is not 2,000, the government may be more relaxed in the conditions. Is that the case? Well, I think the devil is in the details. Will we agree to the principles? But if you have to set so many hurdles, not many people will benefit. So in future, if this is no longer a pilot scheme, the conditions will be better than this one. Otherwise, 
will discuss each and every condition with you. For example, you only give a, a subsidy to those with medium and severe disability or impairment. You set such harsh criteria because this is a pilot scheme, right? If this is not a pilot scheme, you relax your criteria. Secondly, you're going to spend two years on this experiment. This is really miserable. It's, you only conduct a review after two years, and we don't know to what extent you relax the criteria. And the potential recipients don't know for how long they have to wait. And some may have already passed away before it's their turn. Should you give priority to the elders? Because that's what C.Y. Lang said. So when it will be the turn for the PWDs? Can you let us have a timetable? This is an important point. I'll give more time for you to answer. Permanent Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. In fact, in paragraph 12 of the paper, we already say that this, this is a pilot scheme. The pilot scheme does have an objective, that is, to assist the elders from the relatively low-income families. While taking care of the elders, we can subsidize their living. Before the end of this two-year pilot scheme, we'll conduct a review. As said in the paper, we would like to adopt the criteria of the CCF as far as possible. But in the review, we'll also review such criteria. As for the PWDs, as members noted, for this pilot scheme, we'd like to try out the scheme among the elders first. Then we'll gauge the effectiveness and implementation of the scheme before we consider how we should handle this scheme in future so that it will also be helpful to the PWDs and other persons. Well, you say you conduct a review before the end of the two-year period. Then why two years? Can you just have one year for the experiment? It will be shorter then. And then don't give us an excuse. Don't say that you wait and see. For this pilot scheme, you must set objectives. We're only worried about the details. You should tell us that this scheme will be expanded to the PWDs. It's just that in this pilot scheme, you, pi you will try out the details to see how you can rationalize them. Otherwise, we're worried that you only help the elders and not the PWDs. You said you're going to adopt the criteria of the CCF. That's why the criteria are tight. In future, will you not follow the CCF so that you have more relaxed or lenient criteria? Permanent Secretary, we we'll have a policy objective of this pilot scheme. This is to help certain categories of elders. We'll review this objective as well when we review the scheme. Next. Uh, Dr. Fernando Chang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This scheme sounds great and grand. It wants to take care of the carers of the elders. I think members of the public need to know about this scheme. For those taking care of the elderly at home, the burden is heavy, both physically and mentally. In the past, the government has not been providing sufficient services in this regard. There are planning errors. As a result, family members bore the biggest portion of the responsibilities, and sometimes the carers also collapsed. They suffered from physical and mental disorders. So we should give them some financial assistance so that they can improve their living. They can use money to buy certain services so as to improve their living. For the whole pilot scheme, it's $50 million per year, 
and that those 2,000 people would benefit. Well, the discrepancies are huge. We want you to assist the carers, not just the carers of the elders. PWDs and the chronically ill also need caring, and the degree of care they need will not will not be less than that required by the elders. For a person under 65 years old, if he needs 24-hour care from family members, then the carers won't get anything. That's absurd. We want you add them in, you refuse, and your means test is very harsh. And then you want to have hedging between this new subsidy with the old age living allowance and transport allowances, etc. Duration may be cut. Daycare services may not be provided or they're not encouraged to use daycare services. Do you have any long-term objectives for this pilot scheme? If you want the elders to age in community, then you should provide family support and community support. There should be an integrated approach. Now you're going to give them this small allowance. For daycare services, they last from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Beyond those hours, the carer may be spending more than 180 hours per month. But they, you don't want them to go to the daycare centers. So should they receive your allowance or go to the daycare centers? You want the elders to age in the community. The objective of the scheme is not to save money for you, so you must not allow loopholes to occur. So conceptually, you have not thought through this scheme thoroughly, and financially, you are too mean. I can say that you are not dedicated to this. $100 million for two years, that will not be able to address the problems. So please review the whole pilot scheme, the criteria, eligibility, hedging with other allowances and subsidies, hedging, means tests, etc. All these are not in order. Fernando Zhang, you have not left them any time to respond. It's not necessary for them to respond. The whole pilot is wrong. There are five more members for the first round and one for the second round. I'll draw a line there. And the deputy chairman asked me to follow the time schedule. Next, Mr. Pun Siu Peng. Thank you, Madam Chairman. In principle, I do not uh, object to this pilot scheme. Paragraph 5 of the paper says that the proposed allowance should not weaken the sense of family obligation nor diminish the virtue of filial piety. Permanent Secretary, giving this given this level of allowance, the applicant, uh, will he be considered as not observing filial piety? Because this $2,000 is really too little. Well, one carer may take care of two elders, but will you arrange in certain cases for two elders, uh, sorry, two carers to serve one elder, one for the morning session and one for the for the afternoon session. So two carers for one elder. Have you considered that scenario? And for the register, you don't have the particulars of the carers. In two years' time, you may have accumulated some particulars of the carers. In order that the scheme can continue, you should not set a ceiling so that the scheme can be effective. Well, we are very fortunate because in Hong Kong, many children, spouses, or relatives uh, are taking up the role of a carer because in other countries, this is not what's happening. 
uh, because um, if um, money is given to a carer, it is afraid that family relationship will be affected. Um, no studies of this kind has been done in Asia, so we do not know whether this will affect uh, family relationship. So this is a pilot scheme. We try to um, accumulate some experiences. So this is uh, just a pilot scheme, and we do not have an arrangement for uh, an elder who is uh, taken care of by two carers. If there are two carers, they may have to share the two thousand dollars. Well, we'll re we will review the pilot scheme, and then we will look at the situation. Things or criteria uh, may be changed afterwards. So it is very difficult for us to tell you what the uh, way forward will exactly be. Mr. Chen Hokshu, Vice Chairman. Well, you have put together this scheme, so um, I cannot say that you have not uh, consider the difficulties faced by the carers, but there are a lot of uh, restrictions. Now, for a low-income family, if uh, there are children and there are elders to be taken care of, so there are a couple, they have to go to work, and the wife has to take care of the elder and the children. However, if uh, they are on low-income family, Allowance, then um, they cannot get this living allowance. So, if uh, the low income family allowance is lower than four thousand dollars, then you want them to opt for living allowance for carers. Is this the case? Because logically, it does. It is not sound. So, I have several questions for you. I know that after the pilot scheme, the um, government would conduct a review and see if this can become a permanent measure. So is that the case? And also for NECs, DCs, DECCs, etc., they would have to provide training to the carers and provide them with support. So it's not like uh, what the CCF did in the past. It's just a, a one-off formality. And here you haven't mentioned that manpower will be increased. You're just saying that um, there would be some subsidies, for example, administrative costs. So how many carers can a DECC or NEC take care of? Is there a ceiling? Because and this is an extra burden for them. So at the FSA, uh, will you make changes? Because now they will have to do more work in this area, and you are not giving them more manpower. And also, what are the withdrawal um, conditions? Uh, after. Two years, there will be a withdrawal, and you want this to become um, a permanent measure. So, um, how can that be arranged? Well, this is a two-year pilot scheme, and during the implementation of the scheme, we will make assessments. We will listen to views, and. If there are uh, special views, we do not rule out the possibility of making immediate changes. So during the implementation, we will be making assessments. So uh, when the scheme expires, we uh, would know how to uh, make it into a permanent measure or what we should do about it. And in paragraph nine, we understand that well for service delivery agents, they may have to do more work because of this pilot scheme. So we will talk to these agents, 
and see how service fees can be paid to them. Now, because this is a CCF uh, project, so we hope that this will not accept the lump sum grant arrangements because um, CCF uh, will be fucking out some money. I believe I have answered the Vice Chairman's questions. Mr. Long Kwok Hong. Well, Madam Chair, this uh, project is similar to the previous one. Now, if there is a sick chicken and I ask you to eat it, of course you won't eat it. So this is just like um, CY Lang's uh, governance. Now, so when I look at the Secretariat's a background brief. I uh, see the comments made by members earlier on. So for this scheme is actually about a governance philosophy. Now supposedly, our elders should receive services no matter whether they are disabled or not. So as long as they are eligible, we should provide the services to them. And if that service um, costs ten thousand dollars a month and now you are shifting this responsibility on to his relative. Now if all these services are to be provided to the elder and to and um uh, originally, you should pay ten billion dollars, but now you give it a discount and you are just fucking out zero point seven billion dollars. Now this is a pilot scheme. Why is there a quota of two thousand? When we are talking about eighty hours, and the hourly wage is only twenty-five dollars, and if you increase it to one hundred and twenty hours, then the um, hourly rate will be thirty-three dollars. Now this should be a responsibility shouldered by the government. But now you are putting this responsibility on others, but you are giving them a wage lower than the statutory minimum wage. But Yi Chi Ming says that, well, we should go ahead for it at the moment. It will just last for two years. Well, Ms. Chen Yun Han is actually very simple. After two years, when will that be 2016? And that's another election year, and Si Wai Lang will run in the election again, and he thinks that people will forget. So now he uh, starts numerous projects so that he wants to impress people um, so that people will think that uh, he has done a lot of things, and then he can get re-elected. As a logical member, we give you views. Now we say to our views very clearly. However, you screen our views, and some of our views are omitted. So this is what Siwa Lang has been doing. Well, next time when he comes here, when I throw things at him, he would say that, well, I have taken on board your views expressed in um, the years 2011 to 2013. Well, if you think this is feasible, then I think you should have a comprehensive scheme because then you will have a comprehensive sample and also the rate should be increased so that the carers can be happier. And then after two years, you should conduct a review. There should not be a hedging arrangement. If you want to do something good, you should do everything. Well, what laws will there be? And you are just taking care of these carers. Mr. Albert Ho. Well, our members are looking at sub fundamentals and they raise a lot of queries. I share their feelings. In particular, when it comes to the purpose, when I look at it, I feel really uncomfortable. Now, 
you are saying that the proposed allowance should not weaken the sense of family obligation nor diminish the virtue of filial piety. I don't understand. Well, it seems that the carers, if they take money from you, is they are not very nice persons. That's a wrong move, right? Is that what you mean? And how about um, tax allowance for uh, supporting parents and grandparents? If you give them such a tax allowance, does it mean, mean that it will diminish the taxpayer's filial piety? This is a problematic thought. And we have been talking about a number of policies which have to be implemented. And so now the government uh, comes up with these uh, pilot scheme. Of course, this is something we want the government to do. However, the way it does it, uh, the scale and implementation speed are far from satisfactory. I'm talking about the elderly um, community service coupons. Now, we have been uh, talking about it for a long time, and now the government starts to do it, but it's only giving out um, hundreds of these coupons or vouchers. This is a trial, a pilot scheme, and it will last only for two years. But we are talking about elderly people. They do not have many two years. And also for the carers, they are um, really facing a lot of difficulties. And then you have to conduct a review. So how long would that take? Well, this has been discussed by the community for a long time, and things are mature. So if you accept this concept, you should do it right away and comprehensively. So even though if it's a two-year pilot scheme, it should be of a larger scale. It seems that it's an honor system. However, it is not feasible. It's just half an honor system. So the carer would have to put down records, and you would not ask the um, elder to ascertain unless there are disputes. So I don't know how you can verify. So that carer would just have to write you a memo saying that um, he has worked for 80 hours in the previous month. And how about each uh, visit? How many hours per visit? So it's not like what you think. Well, these carers, well, most of them live with the elders. So how can they put down the exact hours? And how can the elder remember? How can he or she verify? So I don't think you should use this so-called honor system because this is not feasible. Now, you want to give allowance to the carer. So if the elder accepts that he's the carer, then you should just give him the allowance because many of them are relatives. And the hatching arrangements is really problematic as well. You're saying that for those on CSSAs, they are not entitled to this allowance. But for the carers, many of them would use the money on the elders. So are you hatching against the carers? Uh, money or the elders' money. Now the carers uh, would need these type of allowance. So why is there such a hedging arrangement? Members, um, I still have to ask questions, and there are other members who would like to ask questions. As I have drawn a line already. And I would like to say something here. I think Mr. Liang Kuo Hong uh, may be right. Now, this is a very good uh, concept put forward by uh, the community, but now the government is making a lot of changes. I am particularly unhappy with the hedging arrangements. I have been thinking about this, and some social workers have also been discussing this. Now, I don't know if it's because um, the government does not have a, 
a lot of money in its covers. Well, the FS has already said that. Well, maybe you can um, increase some types of taxes. Now, for carers of elderly persons, they really need help. And how about carers for the um, for people with disabilities? They also have great needs. I have been a carer myself. Well, I totally understand their plights. And Mr. Pusupi made a very good point. You can say that um, because uh, you do not get any allowance, you are not going to take care of the elders. Just now, Mr. Albert Ho's criticism is correct. You have not positioned yourself yet, and then you come for funding. Then you describe the difficulties facing the CSSA recipients. Yes, Mr. Ho was correct. You haven't thought through all these issues. Behind you, you have social workers to help you. Perhaps you should go back and think about this. Yes, you may not have enough money. Yes, you may not know about the future. Still, there are a lot of problems and loopholes in this proposed pilot scheme. For the OALA and the DA, we have very deep feelings in society. Our colleagues were saying that in actual fact, when carers are willing to provide caring to the elders, a good message has been sent by them. As bystanders, we feel that they are hard pressed. They've been working very, very hard. I don't have enough time to go into the details. It's unnecessary to set so many hurdles. Please go back uh, and think about the money issues. Behind you, what are social workers thinking? Conceptually and logically, there are shortcomings in this pilot scheme. I don't think you should set so many hurdles. Otherwise, there will be a lot of problems. As Mr. Leung Kwok Hong said, you should not just use the statutory minimum wage as an excuse. Don't tell us that this is equivalent to SMW. You have to look at social problems. Well, conceptually, this scheme is generally all right, but there are other issues to be ironed out. Please think about the capital gains tax as well as the sustainability of the CCF. You don't need to answer my questions. I've been quite critical. Next, second round, Mr. Tankapu. Two minutes. I have to emphasize again that this uh, criterion relating to OALA is really strange. Is the government saying that for any new subsidies, the, the family can only get one subsidy concurrently? Well, if you are saying that, you should make this a very clear concept in terms of finance. That means in future, if a family gets textbook subsidies, then it's not going to get other subsidies or allowances. I've been in contact with elderly organizations and carers associations. In many jurisdictions, if it is verified that this carer, this person is a carer and is entitled to an allowance, then I'd like you to produce a user's manual that is easily understood by the general public. That's my opinion. Permanent Secretary, thank you, Madam Chairman. Concerning the OALA and its requirements, as I explained just now, for this proposed living allowance for carers of the elderly persons, the concept is that it is a living allowance. If OALA is being received at the same time, there will be duplication. Let me answer Mr. Albert Ho's question in passing. Now, we're talking about this living allowance for carers. We're not talking about the elders being cared for. 
the elder being cared for can continue to receive the OALA. We're talking about the carer. If it is receiving elderly CSSA and this or OALA, then it is already subsidized in his living. I've already drawn a line. I can only allow one of you or one minute for each of the two of you. One minute. Dr. Fernando Chang. Madam Chairman, today we heard a lot. Principles, concepts, hedging arrangements, income limits, services to be reduced, and so forth. We have a lot of queries about these. After implementing the pilot scheme, can you have a review earlier? She mentioned the second quarter of the second year. I wonder by then whether or not you'll get 1,000 successful applicants amongst the full quota of 2,000. In three months' time, say July, I don't know whether we can still do that. If not, maybe October, can we have uh, an earlier review? Can we arrange for another discussion? Mr. Lang Yuchong, Madam Chairman, just now many colleagues asked many questions. I also asked many questions. We don't have enough time today. Can we ask the Permanent Secretary to come back with uh, another paper? Oh, yes. For the contents of the pilot scheme, we're of the view that the direction is correct, but the details are not all right. Can you submit another paper in the near future? It seems that you are saying no. Long Kok Hong, no more time. Permanent Secretary. To submit another paper in the near future. Madam Chairman, our proposal is that in March the CCF Task Force will have another meeting. If members will agree, we'll reflect members' views expressed today to the CCF Task Force and see what they think. There were members' views about how to handle the paper. We'll relay that to the CCF Task Force as well. They also have to go to the COP before we can implement the pilot scheme. If we hear further views, if they want to change the pilot scheme, we can come back again if necessary. But we have a tight schedule because the SWD would like to implement this latest by the end of the second quarter. So let me go back to the CCF Task Force. The task force will study the proposal and then go to the COP to seek their opinion. I'll come back if there are to be changes. Timing-wise, you should do better. After listening to the CCF task force, before you go to the COP or while you go to the COP, can you also let us have a look at the paper? Is that possible? Do members agree? Honestly speaking, I think the direction of the pilot scheme is correct, but the contents are rather interesting. Before they go to the COP, can they give us a paper? At least give us a CC copy. We should have another discussion so that we have another chance to speak up. Can you CC a copy to us? Can you send us a CC copy? We've heard this opinion, this piece of opinion. I understand that members would like to have a paper. That is, before we go to the COP, we give you another paper. Yes, colleagues, if after reading the paper, we can move a motion if we want. Our next meeting will be held on the 10th of March. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other business? No.